Electronic circuits can be abstracted as components connected in a graph. So let's look at some rules that will help us analyze and design them. First, let's think about a notional component with three terminals that, to which we connect three wires. We've already discussed the idea of charge as moving to form a current. So imagine we have, let's say, some currents that are flowing into this node on one wire and out on two other wires. The nature of charge is that it's conserved. If some number of charges go in, they're not accumulated in this, in this particular node. They have to come out somewhere. So we can think about this as the node is not storing charge, this idealized node. And so uh, some current, which we'll denote with I, this is the typical symbol for current in electronics, um, is flowing in. We'll call that I1. And some current I2 here is flowing out, and some current I3 is flowing out there. Basically, the sum of the currents into, into and out of the node is zero. That depends upon choosing the sign convention appropriately. Here, let's just say that I1 is a positive current flowing in, I2 is a negative current flowing out, and I3 is a negative current flowing out. If we write that formally, what we'll get is a sigma for summation. Some sum of, of all currents, I sub n, is zero. So here, a positive added to two negatives would end up equaling zero, because for every charge that comes in, it comes out either one of the other uh, ports, and we get a, a net total of zero. This is a slight abusive notation because I've drawn this terminal here as a, a device, but what we're thinking about here is really is just like a, a point. Really, it's any device, honestly. So this is this simple rule here has a name. Uh, it was it's called Kirchhoff's current law. Kirchhoff's current law, which we commonly abbreviate simply as KCL. So KCL is going to be a foundational tool, but it's really more a statement about the physics of charge moving through conductors and lets us think more about the nature of electricity. The second we're going to think about is the idea of Ohm's law and resistance. So I'm going to draw a battery as a source of potential, a voltage source. And the battery has some electrochemical potential with a voltage that we designate as V. Now I'm going to draw a symbol for resistor. In truth, resistance is a, is a pretty broad idea. It's, if we think about a two-terminal circuit, and it could be a single component, but it could also be a complicated circuit or your body or a piece of wood or any sort of mass of material that we have two electrical contacts on. It's an empirical observation that if you create a potential across it, current will flow through it. Maybe not very much. Your skin has a fairly high resistance, and so you get a measurable but small current for these modest voltages. A piece of wire has a very low resistance, and so a relatively small voltage will induce a large current in it. But there's some idea that you put a potential across it and voltage will flow, a current, sorry, put a voltage across it, a potential, and current will flow. And it turns out that for a lot of materials, that relationship is pretty linear. So we can say then that there's some property of the resistor, which we're just going to term R, which is its resistance, and it's measured in ohms. And we can observe empirically that you put a potential across it, and you get a current. And these two are related by this constant r. We can trivially rewrite this in a couple algebraic forms to say that v over r equals i, and that v over i equals r. And they're all saying the same thing. It's basically an observation that for most materials, or common materials, if you put a potential across it, you get a current that is linearly related to the potential. You double the voltage, you get double the current. There's always a limit. If you get too much current through something, um, the energy that is represented by those, those charges, you know, falling out that potential, has to go someplace. And for bulk resistors, it turns into heat. The motion of the charges turns into like randomized motion of the material, and it gets hot. And so for most things, if you uh, run too much current through them, they'll heat up. And eventually, they'll heat up enough to melt or, or burn or something. Um, this is the foundational principle behind like an ordinary electric heater. The, the AC currents from the wall are run through some material of fairly low resistance. A lot of current flows. It turns into heat in the material and it gets quite hot. So in our circuit here, we can think about the voltage across the resistor as coming from the battery. And it's an idealized battery here, so it's going to have uh, some constant voltage. And we're going to get a current in the wire. And then this is, these are the relationships that, are, that express that. And then depending on what you're trying to do, you might look at this in different ways. 
If you're trying to calculate the resistance of some circuit or material, you might sample it. You might put a voltage across it and then measure the resulting current. And then by trying different voltages, uh, if you see a linear relationship, then you can fit a curve to that and get resistance. And if you put a voltmeter in its, I'm sorry, a multimeter in its resistance mode across a resistor, that's exactly what it does. It puts out a small voltage and measures the resulting current. Uh, another way to think about it, and it's the same physics as just looking at it from a slightly different lens, is if I want to understand uh, the current through the resistor, if I know its resistance, I know the voltage I'm applying, I can calculate the current um, simply as the voltage divided by the resistance. And then likewise, I can say if I run a current through some resistive material, we could talk about developing a potential. What that really means is in some equilibrium condition for that current flowing through that resistance, that means there has to be some potential across it. And that's, that's the first form we say, like, if I know the current and I know the resistance, then I can calculate the potential that must exist across the resistor. There's different ways to look at it. I mean, you might think about the idea that I'm running the current through the resistance and then a voltage forms. Really, they're all one state of, of being of the current, the resistance, and the voltage that can be looked at in slightly different ways. In terms of units, I said that the res it's measured in, in ohms. The conventional symbol is an omega symbol. So if I say, you know, 3 omega, that would be a 3 ohm resistance. For our purposes, that's a very low resistance. That would be um, above a wire, but well below kind of typical components. A lot of times we're going to deal in thousands of ohms. So a more typical value for us might be what we say 1k. That's short for 1 kilo ohm. But rather than write out one small k omega to mean kilo ohm, in most notation, it's such a common expression that we simply write k, capital K, to mean one kilo ohm. So for example, in our typical circuit examples, we might have some 10k resistors, some 1k resistors, some, uh, um, those are kind of common values for us, as low as potentially 470 ohm resistors. Often in schematics, they'll simply leave out the omega and you'll just see 470. Um, conventionally, the components we have in the lab range down to tens of ohms up to low millions of ohms. Um, and those are kind of conventional for kind of the component circuits that we build. There, now you can see those numbers. Wire has effectively no resistance for our purposes. It is measurable. The typical meter has a little trouble measuring like the kind of hundredth of an ohm to milli milli-ohm kind of resistances of a kind of short piece of wire. Um, but for high current motors and for certain kinds of power circuits, that can start to matter a lot. At transmission line lengths, it matters tremendously. But for our circuits, we're effectively going to treat our actual physical wires as having zero resistance, and we'll get away with it most of the time. Let's think about voltage now. And we're going to talk now about uh, Kirchhoff, has, Kirchhoff has another law, the Kirchhoff voltage law. So let's draw again that batteries, uh, draw a sort of variation of the battery circuit now, only I'm going to write in two resistors. So there's some voltage across the battery, I'll write a plus and minus here. We're going to call the bottom terminal for convenience ground, I'll put a little ground triangle symbol there, so that always by definite means zero volts in our circuit. That's for convenience, voltage is always a property measure between two points, and as we can see here, there really are only two points in our circuit. By the nature of the abstraction, um, the sort of top terminals here, these three terminals here, are connected by this abstracted wire, which has uh, truly zero resistance. So they must all have the same potential. Now we can start to understand why. If we think about having a uh, zero resistance, th there's, a, there's a, a problem that for zero resistance, Basically, no matter how much current you run through it, there's no voltage developed. So basically, the wire being perfect means that no voltage potential can ever exist between these various nodes. So in our graph notation, that collapses down to just being the same idea, and we call it a single node. So let's think now about having R1 and R2, and we put a voltage across them. And we can immediately start to observe a couple things. First of all is, because the top leg of the circuit and the bottom leg of the circuit are idealized just single nodes, each resistor sees the same voltage. The same voltage must appear across both of them, simply because the wires, the virtual wires connecting them are perfect and have zero resistance of their own. So we can think about the kind of currents that must flow. We can say that uh, uh, 
the, the I1 current, the current that's flowing through resistor one, I1, um, uh, let's assume it follows Ohm's law, these are linear resistors, is going to be the voltage of the battery, I'm sorry, the voltage of the battery is going to equal I1 times R1, and the voltage of the battery is also going to equal I2 times R2, simply because we have, um, there, I2, simply because they're attached in parallel across the same battery at the same voltage with these idealized wires. Um, just as an aside, we can actually say now that the, the battery current would simply be the sum of the currents in the resistors by Kirchhoff's current law. All the charges coming out of the battery can go through one resistor or the other, but they don't vanish, so those two have to sum to the same. Now, Kirchhoff's vert voltage law is a way of looking at the various uh, relationships between sort of parts of the circuit as loops. And it's a little hard to get at first, but I'll write it out to say that if we think about the uh, traversing a loop in the circuit and we sum up all the potentials around that loop, what we're going to find is they always sum to zero. It's essentially a restatement of the idea that voltage is measuring a potential and it's a relative motion. So the, the simple analogy is on land. If you go up a hill and then back down a hill, you haven't gone anywhere. If you go up a hill and then down a hill to the same vertical level, you'll have gained gravitational potential, but then lost an equal gravitational potential. And then the gravitational potential between those two isoquanters at the same altitude will be zero. You know, Even if they're physically distant, they're not going to have any difference of height between them. So the analogy here is if I start at some, some point in the circuit, I'm going to start here at the ground. I think about a loop going upwards to the battery um, and then back down through the resistor. Going, measuring the voltage and battery in reverse, I actually get a negative value because I'm measuring it kind of from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. And then we know that we have, in this case, some positive voltage across the resistor, and those two sum to zero. It's also saying that the voltage across the battery is exactly the same as the voltage across the resistor, but because of the loop, I end up measuring them in opposite directions, they have opposite sign, and they cancel. So really, then a second loop here, which would be the loop around uh, resistor one and resistor two, and again, it's the same idea that the volt the currents through the resistors may be different, but the voltage across each resistor is the same. So I measure the voltage from ground to the top rail across R1, I get a negative value. I have a, exactly the opposite sign, positive value going from the top rail back down to ground across R2. The third loop here would simply be the loop that would effectively traverse uh, the battery in R2, and that's analogous to the same uh, loop as for R1. It's turning into a very messy diagram, I'm sorry for that. So really, truly, uh, the key here is that the voltage is measured between two points. In some abstracted sense, there's a potential difference between any two points in the universe, only so many places in the universe can't support current flow between each other that it's not that useful. In our circuits, we're going to think about these discrete nodes as you know, collections of, of component terminals connected together, and then we can measure the voltage between any two nodes in the circuit. Most of the time, we're going to consider this ground to be zero volts and measure other voltages relative to it, just to give us a baseline. So then we can think about the there's a ground that's here at zero, and then the battery has some positive potential with respect to that. There will be many cases, though, that we go to measure the voltage between two other points in the circuit and get a relative measurement. Practically speaking, if you take your multimeter and you put two probes at two different points in the circuit, you'll get a value. If you reverse those probes, you just flip the meter around, you'll get the negative of that value. Just to follow through on that, one final, one final sort of observation there about measurement is measuring voltages is straightforward for our circuits because you can simply take the meter and probe two points. Measuring currents is always slightly more involved because currents flow through points. So if I have some circuit, um, just think of it temporarily as, you know, some chain of components that it each has a resistance. I can simply attach my meter temporarily to these two wires to measure the voltage between them, and I'll get some relative voltage measurement, which is the voltage drop across the resistor. And then that will follow Ohm's law, but there's a voltage drop. If I actually want to directly measure the current through that resistor, there's not an easy way to do it using our equipment. You have to physically insert the meter into the circuit. And then if you have that first resistor, you have to then temporarily insert your meter device, some kind of you know, current meter device, uh, in between some pair of components so that the current flows through the measuring device. So then if we were to go back here and measure, we could still measure our, our voltage between these two points. 
and we'd have to act. We then could have a current flowing through the meter and measure the the, the current in that particular leg of the circuit directly. Most of the time when we're doing these kinds of measurements, we're going to measure voltages and then infer currents, but sometimes it is helpful to directly measure a current. This, by the way, um, sorry, I didn't write this down. I'm going to write then KVL, that's Kirchhoff's voltage law. So just in brief, uh, we've gone through very quickly Kirchhoff's current and voltage laws and Ohm's law, and each of them describes a couple things. Kirchhoff's current law effectively is the idea of that charge is conserved moving through circuit nodes. Charges go in, uh, charges are in, in general are not stored anywhere, they, the, they come out, and so the sum of currents through some point has got equal zero. Ohm's law is, is this, is this uh, empirical observation about materials that there's a linear relationship between the, the voltage and the current for a large class of materials, and then we build components around that idea. K Kirchhoff's voltage law, KVL, is a statement essentially of the relative nature of voltage measurement, but it allows us to look at loops within our circuit and reason that the sum of voltages around those loops has to be zero, and that's a fact that we can use then to analyze other circuits.